En als God nou al in het schaat heb schaap, heb ik een hoofd heb, ik ben toch dood, ik heb een hoofd met mina, ik ben toch stoot met mina, en als God nou al. Nou wat schiet ik aan elkaar niet meer, toch zie ik zo niet aan zo niet, ik weet dat je schiet, ik ben niet schoon, ik heb een man niet aan in een heel man. Maar ja, wat dat nu hier ook, die net al, die net al, die net al, niet aan, I go to the Kapik's Quran, my language. So I'll tell you in English now. I always speak my language when I first go to the podium. And it's a polite way of telling Canadians we are here first. Thank you. Um, so um, thank you so much for being here tonight and for listening to the aspiring poets and the poets, published poets, and, and myself. I appreciate your attendance and um, your interest. Um, I'm, I'm going to just read and let you absorb the words. And you can ask me questions after. I'm always open to anything that needs to be addressed. Dedication to the seventh generation. First of all, I want to thank my in-laws for being here and for hosting me. They were so gracious to pick me up and to drive me around. And for Poetry London for the invitation and Western as well. So, I greatly appreciate it. Aho! Uta I will share these stories, but I will not share those from which I will never crawl. It is best that way. I forget to laugh sometimes, though in these 40 years my life has been filled with towering mornings, northern lights. Sit by the, by the kutawan, the fireplace, drink muskate and mint tea. Hold your soul, but do not weep, not for me not for you. Weep for those who haven't yet sung. Weep for those who will never sing. I cannot say for sure what happened to my mother and my father. The story said she went to St. Anthony's residential school and he went to Blue Quills. They slept on straw mattresses, attended classes for half a day. Mother worked as a seamstress, a kitchen helper, a dining room servant, or labored in the laundry room. Father carried feed for the pigs, cut hay for the cattle, and toiled in a massive garden. That little story is bigger than I can tell. Before the Mornukum and Nemosum, she was a medicine woman whose sweat lodge was hidden away wore prayer beads and always had a pipe dangling from her mouth. Nemosum had his own car back in the 50s and he plowed his own land. He was a wealthy man because they lived in a house while we had a cabin. He lifted the sweat rocks. Or Nukum, that is as far back as I can tell you. All the old man said is that I have nothing to weep about compared to them. I know now where the confusion began. She was a tough mistress, that confusion. We were all caught in her web. Her history is covered in blisters, welts, and open sores. You already know that part. We came later. We were the children that mother and father tried to raise. Yes, they tried. How scared Nemusum and Nukum were. They knew what the priests and nuns supervisors did at those schools. We all left, all of us. Confusion was in our wind. We no longer knew where to turn. There, this is where my foot, footsteps began, where my footprints appear in snow and grass. I don't like walking backwards. Old ones haunt my thoughts, tiny spears that brush the color off my wings. I need them now to help others understand what happened. It wasn't their fault. It wasn't our fault. Confusion was the ultimate glutton. 
He came from far away, wore black robes, and carried a crucifix. He was armed with laws, blankets, and guns. He fixed us with a treaty that he soon forgot. Sometimes the end is told before the beginning. One must walk backwards on footprints that walked forward for the story to be told. I will try this backward walk. I found myself released from residential school, yet the four walls slittered everywhere I went. I had no regimented call to wake up, line up for breakfast, for dinner, for supper, for school, and no one checking the work I did. There were no boarding school dresses, no tabs to fight over. I didn't know how to behave, didn't know what was expected at the Indian Affairs homes. I was expected to carry on my reading, writing, and arithmetic. I didn't know how to register for class, how to study, how to ask. Silence and humiliation wore my umbilical cord in this new womb. I wandered, calling inside my own name. I stretched the boundaries of my skin and crucified the edges so I have something to cling to. A hunchback inhabits my body. Sixty winters grips my wrists. I've carried a turtle shell. It protected me far too long. I peel it off and take a toddler's step on this red road. Now others ask me to turn my skin inside out. They want to know how I survive this hot, cold trail. I prefer to keep silence as my guest. I want to keep my dead from spilling. I don't want to deal with their writhing wounds. I walk behind them trying to read their trailing guts. I am in the back alley of my thoughts. There were no curtains, no attics, no cellars to hide in. My niece was two when my father took her by her feet and threw her across the room. She landed on Nilcom's bed. I watched this from where no sound crept from my lips. She was five when she threw a pencil at his ear after he broke a jar and slashed mother's arm. He held a stick of firewood over her head while she searched for the pencil among the staff. There were no drunken spirits that night, just a bowl full of angry angie, genies. I watched the cinema. We huddled beneath the blanket whispering about the great escape, as if to escape the cabin's door could be had. The kerosene lamp and small embers in a wood stove were all that were lit, as if the shack was a lover's den. Much much like chewing weakest, choking down buckleys, taking thyroid radi radiation or pills for bipolar, injecting for diabetes or an AIDS cocktail, I swallow the seed of blindness. I don't consume it gladly. Rooting and digging like a bear is not my idea of flying with the eagle. Like my mother, I'd rather step on the buffalo's back and shove my memories deep into the closet. But I promised, promised to stitch and sew, use colorful embroidery thread, and mend this soul. I promised, promised to be the company I wanted to keep, and promised grip my flesh and her talons when I pulled my inner eye away from my foe. I heard it is so much easier to drown or infect my liver with wine, needles, and dark alleys, swim into the tears unconscious yet awake, dance with these cannibals. It is better to dance with memory than be noosed by the gut. An uncle shot his wife, left her lying behind the house with a rifle at her side. Their four children peered behind the curtains. He was never able to look at anyone. A lake held him as he froze, standing, clutching his traps. One, uh, one son joined the Marines, 
A mosquito killed him in Vietnam. In a police chase, another son hit a slew and drowned in his grave. Your little brother slept in a flaming house with needles, spoons, heroin, and cocaine. My cousin was left alone. I remember them. In the dark times, Nimasu moved like the horses he hitched to the plow. His constant companion was silence herself. Nokum stayed closed, wandered to the attic for her medicines, or crawled into her sweat lodge. Gone were the days when wagon loads of families went stooking, gathering eggs, blueberry picking and fishing. Now they gathered to the clanking of brown bottles, back road trips to the bootlegger, squabbles and fistfights along the famished road. We, the young, were their inheritors. I hid in the back alley, peering through the cracks of the fence, listening to my mother calling, my father shouting. The rain fell like bullets and the heat bled from my eyes. I had escaped, ran from the car, left the child my father had slammed across the room. Our guts knew that the madness had again descended. I ran. When they arrived, the pounding began. The swearing tore our ears, muted our tongues. I ran, blind, I ran. I knocked on the door where the sugar beet bosses lived. It slammed in my face. I walked the streets, found my way to the police, was scolded for wandering this slippery night. When they arrived, my father shook his fist. In the hotel lobby, an angel gave me a soda while I trembled in my wetness. Other angels took me to their bed and I slept between them. There are times memory allows me to sleep. When I was in a plundering school, I often visited the confessional. The earth moved under me and my knees wobbled into the pew. A rolling plow wind darkened a small light above the priest's head and bile spewed from my mouth. I confess, I wanted another girl's boyfriend, lusted for his mouth though I'd never been kissed. Another girl and I exchanged ugly words and she slammed the door on my bare feet. I wanted to get even so we fought outside the gym. I looked over Brian's shoulder so I could spill, spell my words. I vomited all over his back. I hated the supervisor who stole my money and said I was a lying thief. I hated another one who never taught me a girl's moon came every month and I had to hide this visit, hide my tiny breasts. I hated the woman who marched the little girl who peed her bed in front of all of us. My eyes swelled, leaked pus. My morning breath foul from the confessional, the Hail Mary slid down my belly. When I returned to the log shack, all that was left was a hole filled with fireweed. My mother, my father were strangers. I'd watch them how the devil took my father's hand and lifted another woman's skirt. My mother's feebleness fought against my, un my uncle's goatishness. Those spirits we consumed brought each of us blackouts that only skid row dwellers would know. I make no excuse for being a dog in heat or the raging beast I'd become in this dark forest. If I could take back that night when I dumped my friend in the fields of nowhere in my drunken rage to hitchhike the thousand miles of fright, I would. But instead, I collect these night visitors to tell this story, to reach the heart where history placed its frostbite on our ragged souls. I've dressed, dredged this artesian well, and if I could, I'd burn my flesh and kill this fiend. I don't want to whine about the absence of family. For many years, I walked along the eating waters of the elbow, the red deer where I eyed their great invitation. 
I don't want to tell of the many miles of gravel I yearned to run. In the forest where I snared rabbits and nibbled bannock is where I hid my dreams. Why should I complain about my back hawing those sugar beets waiting to collect my pay so I could ride the Ferris wheel in Lethbridge and not wait beside a bar with a hungry belly and wasted wands? What about the years and years of living with a pack of girls fighting over institutional dresses or kneeling in front of the crucifix calling Jesus to send my mother and father to visit us from hell? Why tell about the secrets in their lodge hidden in my bleached bones? That is another winter's tale. I had long given up kneeling to the Christ. I hoarded all my sins inside my turtle shell, unable to walk. I continued to suckle. If someone told me I was in love with myself, I'd have told them about scrubbing the deep layers of my skin under the eyes of the nuns, supervisors, and priests. I thought that college social work would become my therapist, but the computer spoke a language 10,000 miles from Cree. I failed so many tests. Was told I was dumber than, never mind. This mantra I already had inside my head. My parents were unskilled laborers, hardworking, dedicated dirt beneath their fingernails, and I applied those gifts, scrubbing toilets, waiting on the tables, emptying urinals, and I vowed I'd get that damn degree. I boarded with a family whose ompa tried to slip into my bed. There were strangers happy to take Indian Affairs orphans and keep my roommate and me in a cubby hole. At school, my grades were below my belt and extracurricular activities were scrubbing floors at homes where I thought movie stars lived. Or I'd be back in bars slamming back beers of joy as real as Santa Claus. It never occurred to me to write my family. Forgot they existed never received a letter, a telephone call. But after so many years of isolation, I'd come to expect this, and even expecting this was unexpected. In the near distant, music drifts through the silence of the house. The dogs wrestle and scratch the floor. Outside, weeds sway back and forth, and trees do a small, circular dance. I don't understand this way of plants when there's no juice in their veins to make them bend and tremble. You'd think they'd snap from the breath of the winter wind. I once pranced like a colt and moved with the grace of a deer. I bathed in the cool mountain falls while my lover swam in a nearby pool. For those moments, I was free to absorb the frothing water. When I looked up, I saw two men staring through the branches. A hurricane of terror thor tore through my chest. I am often filled with ghosts that glide through my body. They have no business intruding into thought or work at hand. They hang by their feet in my lair, folding and unfolding their wings as I hover like a bee on a cherry blossom. When memory awakens, it becomes a flash flood and offers no forgiveness. I've struggled tonight with what needs to be pulled from my gut. It's 1971. I don't remember the night's celebration. I wish I could speak as if I were a white teenager and brag about that party like so many I've heard. I had an interview that morning, showing up with spirits clinging to my breath, and an air that said I've been doing this all my life, joking and being familiar with the panel of questioners. I was their troubled youth and they wanted to say whatever grace was left. My sister collected money put me on a plane for a taste of Jamaica. 
I danced to Mewel Train, witnessed song and labored in the making of a brick school on a mountain top. I played hard, drank that Jamaican run, shared my brother's motto and worked to die young. I was a heroine of small books I read, wore a leather jacket, had the mouth of a truck driver, but no other speech. The children were meat for the scavengers, Indian affairs, the brick walls, the saints of many churches. Filled with, with their disease, we ate the maggots off their dead. This cannibalism devoured our mother's heart. Yes, I followed this routine, clapping hands and electric light on our knees to give the price a difficult time, no time to rub the sleep from our eyes. Each month, I counted the stars to see how often I'd gone to mass, my heart so wanting, marched to breakfast to the scullery, hand peeled potatoes, washed the many pots and pans under the supervision of the kitchen nuns to the laundry room to starch and iron, to the rectory to serve the higher and saints, and finally to school to swallow Europe. In those many seasons, our winds took a turn and entered winter. When we were released, with no hair to braid, no language to call our own, no parent to cradle us, those storms awoke. I know this landslide is hard to bear. I've pulled the stink weeds for you to ingest. Yet this is one story of many lives. Too many lives. I'm going to read um, the last poem, and it is written by Rupert Ross. And how many of you are familiar with Rupert Ross? He was an attorney general, um, attorney, um, crown attorney for the District of Kenora, Ontario. He was a lawyer, and he wrote, he's the author of Dancing with the Ghosts, Exploring Indian Reality, Returning to the Teachings, and um, a good friend of mine, and, and he wrote um, this poem in response to uh, this book, Owners of Themselves. I have encountered so much silence, but when people come before the TRC, their overarching silence to me overwhelmed the tidbits they were capable of offering. I kept waiting for their dams to break, and hoping that they wouldn't, not right then, not so alone, and far from home. I kept wishing that every teller would have two grandchildren beside them as they spoke, a boy, a girl, so they could support the old people as they fell into their dark holes of memory, and so they could also start to draw the lines that connected the sense of self of those grandchildren to the lives of those old people started to reveal. Until those lines began to emerge and take hold, they could not call themselves owners of themselves because they have, they had to have, um, because they had to be given a history to see themselves within. They lived in simple, unattached chaos far too many of them with so little control over how they might respond to anything. Dear Poop, forgive me for writing on this newspaper. I found it in the outhouse, saw lines that say you are sorry. Some of my Indian friends say it's good, but some of them say you're sorry, don't walk. So I was thinking that we may be talk. Say, I always want to tell you to stay out of my business. If me wants to talk to trees and build nests in house, that's up to me. If me wants to pitch my tent and feed the ghost bannock and berries and maybe throw some Indian popcorn for you, Jesus, that's up to me. I don't ask forgiveness, not one hand marries or step ladder to heaven. Me is happy with the sky, the bird inuak, four-legged inuak, I is happy. 
Sorry means that I don't need your church and your priest telling me what to do. Sorry means that I'm free to talk to Manitou, the spirits and plant in or. That's all for now, Pooh. Maybe we talk again next time I see you in the newspaper in the outhouse. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it.